This week's story is called Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Chapter one is called Run. Sometimes in big Hollywood movies, they'll have these crazy chase scenes where somebody jumps or gets thrown from a moving car. The person hits the ground and rolls for a bit. Then they come to a stop and pop up and dust themselves off like it was no big deal. Whenever I see that, I think, that's rubbish. Getting thrown out of a moving car hurts way worse than that. I was nine years old when my mother threw me out of a moving car. It happened on a Sunday. I know it was on a Sunday because we were coming home from church, and every Sunday in my childhood meant church. We never missed church. My mother was, and still is, a deeply religious woman, very Christian, like indigenous peoples around the world. Black South Africans adopted the religion of our colonizers. By adopt, I mean it was forced on us. The white man was quite stern with the native. You need to pray to Jesus, he said. Jesus will save you. To which the native replied, well, we do need to be saved, saved from you, but that's besides the point. So, let's give this Jesus thing a shot. My whole family is religious, but where my mother was team Jesus all the way, my grandmother balanced her Christian faith with the traditional Shona beliefs she'd grown up with communicating with the spirits of our ancestors. For a long time, I didn't understand why so many black people had abandoned their indigenous faith for Christianity. But the more we went to church and the longer I sat in those pews, the more I learned about how Christianity works. If you're Native American and you pray to the wolves, you're a savage. If you're African and you pray to your ancestors, you're primitive. But when white people pray to a guy who turns water into wine, well, that's just common sense. My childhood involved church or some form of church at least four nights a week. Tuesday night was the prayer meeting. Wednesday night was the Bible study. Thursday night was youth church. Friday and Saturday we had off. Time to sin. Then on Sunday we went to church. Three churches to be precise. The reason we went to three churches was because my mom said each church gave her something different. The first church offered jubilant praise of the Lord. The second church offered deep analysis of the scripture, which my mom loved. The third church offered passion and catharsis. It was a place where you truly felt the presence of the Holy Spirit inside you. Completely by coincidence, as we moved back and forth between these churches, I noticed that each one had its own distinct racial makeup. Jubilant church was mixed church. Analytical church was white church. And passionate cathartic church was the black church. Mixed church was Rima Bible Church. Rima was one of those huge, supermodern, suburban mega churches. The pastor, Ray McCauley, was an ex-bodybuilder with a big smile and the personality of a cheerleader. Pastor Ray had competed in the 1974 Mr. Universe competition. He placed third. The winner that year was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Every week, Ray would be up on stage working really hard to make Jesus cool. There was arena-style seating and a rock band jamming out with the latest Christian contemporary pop. Everyone sang along, and if you didn't know the words, that was okay because they were all right up there on the jumbotron for you. It was Christian karaoke, basically. I always had a blast at mixed church. White church was Rosebank Union in Santon, a very white and wealthy part of Johannesburg. I loved white church because I didn't actually have to go to the main service. My mom would go to that, and I would go to the youth side, to Sunday school. In Sunday school, we got to read cool stories. Noah and the Flood was obviously a favorite. I had a personal stake there, but I also loved the stories about Moses parting the Red Sea, David slaying Goliath, Jesus whipping the money changers in the temple. I grew up in a home with very little exposure to popular culture. Boys to men were not allowed in my mother's house. Songs about some guy grinding on a girl all night long. No, 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 that was forbidden. I'd hear the other kids at school singing, 
end of the road, and I'd have no clue what was going on. I knew of these boys to men, but I didn't really know who they were. The only music I knew was from church. Soaring, uplifting songs praising Jesus. It was the same with movies. My mom didn't want my mind polluted by movies with sex and violence. So the Bible was my action movie. Samson was my superhero. He was my he-man. A guy beating a thousand people to death with the jawbone of a donkey? That's pretty badass. Eventually, you get to Paul writing letters to the Ephesians, and it loses the plot. But the Old Testament and the Gospels? I could quote you anything from those pages, chapter and verse. There were Bible games and quizzes every week at White Church. And I kicked everyone's ass. Then there was Black Church. There was always some kind of Black Church service going on somewhere, and we tried them all. In the township, that typically meant an outdoor tent revival style church. We usually went to my grandmother's church, an old school Methodist congregation. 500 African grannies in blue and white blouses, clutching their Bibles and patiently burning in the hot African sun. Black church was rough, I won't lie. No air conditioning, conditioning no lyrics up on jumbotrons. And it lasted forever three or four hours at least, which confused me because white church was only like an hour, in and out, thanks for coming. But at black church, I would sit there for what felt like an eternity, trying to figure out why time moved so slowly. Is it possible for time to actually stop? If so, why does it stop at black church and not at white church? I eventually decided black people needed more time with Jesus because we suffered more. I'm here to fill up on my blessings for the week, my mother used to say. The more time we spent at church, she reckoned, the more blessings we accrued, like a Starbucks reward card. Black church had one saving grace. If I could make it to the third or fourth hour, i get to watch the pastor cast demons out of people. People obsessed by demons would start running up and down the aisles like madmen, screaming in tongues. The ushers would tackle them like bouncers at a club and hold them down for the pastor. The pastor would grab their heads and violently shake them back and forth, shouting, I cast this spirit out in the name of Jesus. Some pastors were more violent than others, but what they all had in common was that they wouldn't stop until the demon was gone and the congregant had gone limp and collapsed on the stage. The person had to fall, because if he didn't fall, that meant the demon was powerful, and the pastor needed to come at him even harder. You could be a linebacker in the NFL. Didn't matter. That pastor was taking you down. Good Lord, that was fun. Christian Karaoke badass action stories, and violent faith healers. Man, I loved church. The thing I didn't love was the lengths we had to go to in order to get to church. It was an epic slog. We lived in Eden Park, a tiny suburb, way outside Johannesburg. It took us an hour to get to the white church, another 45 minutes to get to mixed church, and another 45 minutes to drive out to Sowito for Black Church. Then if that wasn't bad enough, some Sundays we'd double back to White Church for a special evening service. By the time we finally got home at night, I'd collapse into bed. This particular Sunday, the Sunday I was hurled from a moving car, started out like any other Sunday. My mom woke me up, made me porridge for breakfast. I took my bath while she dressed my baby brother Andrew, who was nine months old. Then we went out to the driveway, but once we were finally all strapped in and ready to go, the car wouldn't start. My mom had this ancient, broken-down, bright tangerine Volkswagen Beetle that she picked up for next to nothing. The reason she got it for next to nothing was because it was always breaking down. To this day, I hate second-hand cars. Almost everything that's ever gone wrong in my life I can trace back to a second-hand car. Second-hand cars made me get detention for being late to school. Second-hand cars left us hitchhiking on the side of the freeway. 
A second-hand car was also the reason my mom got married. If it hadn't been for the Volkswagen Beetle not working, we never would have looked for the mechanic who became the husband who became the stepfather, who became the man who tortured us for years and put a bullet in the back of my mother's head. I'll take the new car with the warranty every time. As much as I loved church, the idea of a nine-hour sermon from mixed church to white church to black church, the doubling back to white church again, was just too much to contemplate. It was bad enough in a car, but Taking public transport would be twice as long and try it twice as hard. When the Volkswagen refused to start in my side my head, I was always praying, please say we'll just stay home. Please say we'll just stay home. Then I glanced over to see the determined look on my mother's face, her jaw set, and I knew I had a long day ahead of me. Come, she said, we're going to catch the minibuses. My mother is as stubborn as she is religious. Once her mind is made up, that's it. Indeed, obstacles that would normally lead a person to change their plans, like a car breaking down, often made her more determined to forge ahead. It's the devil, she said as the car stalled. The devil doesn't want us to go to church. That's why we've got to catch minibuses. Whenever I found myself up against my mother's faith-based obstinacy, I would try as respectfully as possible to counter with an opposing point of view. Or, I said, the Lord knows that today we shouldn't go to church, which is why he made sure the car wouldn't start. So that way, so that we stay home as a family and take a day of rest, because even the Lord rested. Ah, oh, that's the devil talking, Trevor. No, because Jesus is in control, and if Jesus is in control and we pray to Jesus, he would let the car start, but he hasn't. Therefore, no, Trevor. Sometimes Jesus puts obstacles in our way to see if you overcome them, like Job. This wouldn't, this could be a test. Ah, yes, Mom, but the test could be to see if we are willing to accept what has happened and stay at home and praise Jesus for his wisdom. Nope, that's the devil talking. Now go change your clothes. But, Mom, Trevor, Sanquila. Sanquila is a phrase with many shades of meaning. It says, don't undermine me, don't underestimate me, or just try me. It's a command and a threat all at once. It's a common thing for Shona parents to say to their kids. Anytime I heard it, I knew it meant the conversation was over. And if I uttered another word, I was in for a hiding, what we call a spanking. At the time, I attended a private Catholic school called Maryvale College. I was the champion of the Maryvale Sports Day every single year, and my mother won the mom's trophy every single year. Why? Because she was always chasing me to kick my ass, and I was always running not to get my ass kicked. Nobody ran like me and my mom. She wasn't one of those come over here and get your hid hiding type moms. She'd deliver it to you free of charge. She was a thrower, too. Whatever was next to her was coming at you. If it was something breakable, I had to catch it and put it down. If it broke, that was my fault, too. And the ass-kicking would be that much worse. If she threw a vase at me, I'd have to catch it, put it down, and then run. In a split second, I'd have to think, is it valuable? Yes. Is it breakable? Yes. Catch it. Put it down. Now run. If you enjoyed getting a little glimpse into Trevor Noah's childhood, you may consider checking this book out from your classroom library, or it's also available on the school library.